Mr. Bleker, and I'm your co-moderator co during today's webinar on venture capital and institutional investors in the Netherlands. Today's event is hosted by the TFA VBA Society, so before starting out, I would like to thank Irma Willemsen and Maarten Mosselman of the TFA VBA Society. Irma cannot be here today, but Maarten is here to make sure that everything runs smoothly. Today's event is organized by the Society's Private Equity and Venture Capital Committee, of which I'm only one of a group of six volunteers. Together, we are on a mission. We want to support the further development of Dutch VC and private equity as an asset class that is attractive to institutional investors and increase access uh, for a broader range of Dutch GPs, Dutch VC fund managers to Dutch institutional capital. So before continuing, I would also like to introduce or reintroduce my fellow committee members of the Society's PE and VC committee, and they are Sam Tui, He's an equity officer at, uh, at Global Impact Investor Oiko Credit, Armsweer Medendorp, who's a strategy lead at Agon Asset Management, Lodewijk van Pol, who's an uh, investment policy advisor and a board member of various Dutch pension funds, Huub van Berkel, who's an investment manager um, for the pension plans at Mars, the big food manufacturer, and finally, uh, Dirk Jan Beugeldijk, he's the CFO at Gilde Healthcare, the Dutch venture capital and private equity firm specialized in healthcare. Dirk Jan uh, will actually be my co-moderator today as he, together with Martin from CFA GBA Society, will be watching out for your questions in the chat function. So for any question that you may already have or um, that may arise during today's webinar, please use the chat function. If we have enough time, um, there might also be the opportunity to raise your question in person. In that case, there's a possibility to digitally, digitally raise your hand and, of course, to unmute yourself and make sure that you have your camera on so that you can, can speak up and that we can see you. Um, so during the webinar, I would, also, I would like to ask you to put yourself on mute. Um, and for good order, uh, I need to add that the webinar is being rec recorded. Sh uh, should that be a problem, please reach out to your contact at CFA VBA Society or just uh, put that in the chat. I think this is it as far as how tools for the webinar. Uh, I'm just going to pause for a second to allow Martin or one of my uh, committee colleagues to add anything that I may have forgotten. Okay, so if there's nothing, um, then we can go back to the, the topic of today. Uh, so what are we going to discuss today and how are we going to go about it? Um, today's webinar is actually the second event that we jointly created with the NVP. Uh, and the NVP is the Dutch Private Equity Association. It was actually a, a publication by the NVP entitled uh, The Untapped Potential of Dutch Venture Capital that uh, served as an inspiration to today's webinar. So I'm very happy to have as our main speaker today, again, the co-author of this insp inspiring publication. Uh, it's Mr. Felix Dwart, and he will put us all on the same page with a 15-minute presentation. After Felix's presentation, we will get to the second part of the webinar, which uh, is perhaps best described as a fireside chat, uh, during which we will direct some questions to, um, to VC industry captains, uh, Jan Willem Bakker from Prime Ventures, Edward van Wezel from Biogeneration Ventures, and Hans de Ruiter from TNO Pension Fund. But now, and without further ado, I'm happy to introduce you to none other than the man who must um, through years of in-depth uh, research, uh, uh, who must have the best insights in the Dutch uh, VC and P industry in the Netherlands, uh, it's Mr. Felix Schwartz from the NVP. Felix, oh. thank you for uh, very much for taking center stage today, and the floor is all yours for the next 15 minutes. <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Berg. It's uh, great to be here again. Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, we practice this and so I should be able to get my presentation on the screen. I think it is there. Yes, it worked. All right. Um, thank you so much for having me. My name is Felix. I'm director of research and policy at the NVP, the Dutch Private Equity and Venture Capital Association. 
Uh, I'll be talking about venture and growth capital today. Growth capital is the more uh, mature uh, follow-up to uh, venture capital in general, but uh, I think that's uh, together with venture capital, they provide an interesting asset class. And that is also what our publication uh, mentioned uh, earlier, uh, Berg, uh, the untapped potential of private equity of, of venture capital is about, that we uh, published just uh, before Christmas. Um, I have a big uh, slide deck. Uh, I'm going to skip a few of those slides today, uh, but no worries, you will uh, get the slide deck later. And you can also always, uh, um, uh, sorry, is there, is there a comment on, uh, is, can't you see the, I saw something in there. You can uh, see your speaking notes, so you should. Oh, the other, we need the other screen. Ah, yeah. okay. Yeah. Ah, um, and we don't need this something else. No. Oh. Um, this one. Perfect. Ah, okay. Thank you. Well, always, uh, always a thing. <laughs> Even after two years. Um, let's have a look. Uh, MVP, a short recap. Um. We're the Trade Association for Venture Capital Private Equity in the Netherlands. We were founded in 1984. Our chair is Enri Jortsma, a former Deputy Prime Minister. And with nine people, we represent the interests of uh, the industry. We have about 105 members. 40% of them are venture capitalists. And uh, the rest of them are primarily private equity uh, strategy and fund the fund. We also have about 90 associated members who are uh, well, advisors on any part of the investment process. What we do is, uh, well, lobby, uh, represent interests of our industry, GPs, to uh, politicians in The Hague and Brussels. And one of the key pillars how we do that is by research. We uh, have uh, had done, we've done research about the amounts invested, the amounts divested, and the amounts raised from investors uh, for new funds since uh, the late 80s and uh, since 2007 we have a common sh platform together with uh, the other european associations for private equity and venture capital so we have a very good overview of what the market does uh, in europe um, it's not just uh, uh, information about activity how much was invested but also how much uh, people are employed in private equity, venture capital owned companies. For instance, we, we estimate that uh, about 2.7 million people have a job in uh, companies supported by growth capital and about 550,000 people are working at a company supported by venture capital in Europe. And just in the Netherlands, in uh, North Holland alone, there are 210,000 people working at a company uh, that uh, is private equity or venture capital owned. You can find all this on our website, uh, nvp.nl, but also on the website of Invest Europe. And if you would like to have uh, some more specialized publications about, for instance, returns in venture capital, private equity, please let me know. I can help you with that. Uh, but without uh, further ado, let's go to the numbers. Uh, these have been published uh, just last week for the European uh, universe, the uh, European scale. Uh, and, and just this week, we will have uh, the publication of our uh, Dutch numbers. So you have a sort of a premiere here. Um, this is uh, two things, uh, the blue columns and the left axis, that is the total amount invested in European companies uh, over the last few years. So we see a very sharp increase over the last uh, few years in the amount of venture capital invested in European countries. The, the lines represent uh, particular countries and there are, they must be read on the right axis. So uh, in the, uh, the Netherlands in 2021, about 1.8 billion of venture capital was invested. A sharp increase from uh, the years previous and uh, very much in line with uh, other European countries. We've seen a very sharp increase over the last few years. I think this is a impressive number just uh, on itself in absolute terms for the Netherlands. But when you count this on a per capita basis, uh, for instance, Germany or France, where 60 million people live, 
And you see that they have a little bit over 2.8 billion of venture capital investments. And the Netherlands with 18 million is 1.8 billion. Well, that, that really uh, shows that the Netherlands is one of the, the, the most developed markets for venture capital in, in, in Europe. Um, looking at the number of companies that have received venture capital investments, we see a, a bit more of a nuanced uh, image. Uh, last year on European uh, scale, about a little less than 5,000 uh, companies received venture capital funding. Uh, that is a slight increase over previous years, but when you look at individual countries, the, the growth is not as pronounced. So that really shows that uh, companies have been able to attract larger rounds from investors. A very uh, yeah, positive uh, development, uh, probably. Um, looking at growth capital, a little bit more mature uh, venture capital, uh, up until, uh, well, venture capital is usually up until Series D in our what we see, and the growth capital is a bit more mature, CSD. And it also here, we see a very remarkable uh, increase in funding, uh, actually uh, across the board uh, in several countries, but also on the European average. Also, the Netherlands, a very pronounced increase. Um, and the same goes here, that the number of companies receiving growth capital hasn't received, hasn't increased that dramatically. So larger rounds in uh, companies uh, from growth capital investors. Um, zooming in a little bit more on the Netherlands, we see this increase, uh, well, on a different scale, a bit more dramatic even. Uh, last year, we've seen a very sharp increase in venture capital investments. In, this, is, this is what in the blue column, what Dutch companies receive from foreign and uh, domestic uh, VCs. And in the two lines, I've plotted uh, what they receive from uh, Dutch VCs uh, in orange, naturally, and in black from foreign VCs. And up until a few years ago, the, these, these were sort of evenly divided. But since uh, 2020, uh, we see a sharp increase in the amounts invested by foreign VCs in Dutch companies which uh, is, is, of course, a fantastic thing. That means that we have very good companies uh, being able to attract uh, capital internationally and uh, to expand uh, even further. Um, and also, well, but when we look at how the uh, activity was uh, uh, in the number of companies receiving uh, investments, we see that Dutch VCs have really increased their activity over the last few years. So uh, from a little over 50 country uh, companies in 2016 to well over uh, 100, close to 150 uh, in the last year. But the international VCs have really started deploying more money in, well, a little bit more companies. Um, and for growth capital, we see this same. This is the amounts invested in euros, a sharp, sharp increase in the last year, some very large rounds in a few companies that uh, are also well known, but also across the board, we see more larger rounds in what uh, even a few years ago, we would uh, thought would be remarkable. Um, this is also, well, the, here the, the difference in activity in com companies receiving investment is a bit more pronounced, but uh, still larger rounds in, in uh, companies. Um, yeah, well, that is, uh, of course, uh, a positive thing, but uh, the, I think uh, the, the, the gap is widening between what uh, Dutch VCs can do and uh, what foreign VCs uh, can do and what kind of rounds they can accommodate. And this is becoming maybe a bit more of a problem. That was also what our publication was about. And maybe it becomes a bit more apparent when we look at fundraising, how much capital was raised from investors over the last few years. In the blue column, and we have to read the left axis on this, we see total amounts raised by European VCs from investors over the years very sharp increase uh, over the longer term. I think this is a very positive uh, development. The, the asset class really is maturing on a European scale. You can see that. Outlier in this, of course, is the UK, which has had the longest 
history also of VC investments. Uh, France also a large market. Uh, I think for the size of its economy, Germany is not really uh, that impressive, uh, but still, uh, of course, uh, an important market. The Netherlands has seen a gradual increase over the last few years, with also uh, larger funds being raised. Last year saw a few outliers, but uh, we really see that the average uh, fund that is raised from investors in VC has increased in the Netherlands. And in, indeed, when we look at the per capita basis, this is uh, well an impressive feat for the Dutch market, I would say. Really shows the development of the market. And uh, this is also the case when we look at uh, how many funds were raised per country. Um, in the Dutch case, not so much, uh, it was sort of a steady uh, feel. Uh, every year, about the same amount of companies was of funds was raised, a slight increase, but this really shows that the size of the funds that is raised has increased uh, quite dramatically. Whereas in the UK and in France, this has gradually, has, has both increased. And uh, well, in Germany and Sweden, uh, this has sort of uh, not been the case. Uh, same amount of funds and sort of uh, slight increase in the size of the funds that has uh, been raised. Interesting. Uh, what we see, especially in the life sciences uh, space, we see uh, larger funds being raised, but also in tech, agriculture, and uh, other areas for the Netherlands, it is. Um, when we look at growth capital, uh, we see uh, a few things. This market has really developed over the last few years, um, from 2016 onwards, actually. But uh, it is very much dominated by uh, UK and France uh, on the European scale. Um, for instance, um, of uh, half of the market in 2020 for growth capital that was raised on European scale was in the UK. And uh, also France, uh, well, is a very large part of that. And the rest of Europe, uh, the countries that are selected, this is really a developing market. Um, uh, for for these uh, the fund managers based in those geographies, you can also see that in the amounts, uh, uh, the number of funds being raised, very much dominated by France. We can see that uh, uh, actually also in the. Um, uh, companies uh, receiving growth capital, uh, something I haven't realized maybe before, is how, that France, in a way, seems to be the, the growth capital of uh, growth capital uh, in Europe. Um, uh, many funds, many investments, really uh, not um, the rest of Europe really uh, is a lot lower in that. Um, which is a pity because I think uh, especially growth capital offers many opportunities to deploy large amounts of capital uh, for promising new technologies. So uh, maybe a lot of potential here. Having a further look at uh, fundraising, this uh, is on the blue column, the total amount raised uh, from uh, pension funds by European VCs on the left column. Um, so, um, and on the individual countries, we see uh, how much uh, was raised from pension funds uh, by VCs in that particular country. Uh, what is remarkable is that pension funds have slowly started to be get more interest in uh, the, the asset class VC since 2018. But that's been mainly driven by UK funds. Uh, UK VC managers are, are one of the few uh, EU um, of uh, European uh, VC managers that have been able to tap into this asset class, uh, LP class. Um, whereas in the rest of Europe, it is uh, quite erratic. We see this outlier in, uh, in Sweden in 2019 um, and a few other outliers. Of course, it can be explained through institutional factors. France doesn't have many pension funds, neither does uh, Germany. But, of course, where, where do we do have very large pension funds, it is in the Netherlands. So it is remarkable that uh, the Netherlands Dutch VC fund managers haven't been able to tap into this LP base. Uh, 
high net worth individuals and family offices on the other hand they have really started to increase their allocation to uh, private to venture capital uh, we see this uh, dutch managers have been really able to, to tap into this also uk french managers surprisingly not so much in germany and in sweden i uh, well I, have, I don't really know why that is but um yeah, the Dutch uh, have been really able to tap into this investor base. I think a uh, very uh, interesting point. Uh, insurers, this is also maybe more of an institutional thing per country. Um, France has a large ins uh, insurer company uh, sector, uh, so naturally more uh, involved in uh, the asset class than in other countries. Uh, Germany is a very erratic uh, outlier in, in 2019. But that's about it. The government, very important as a funder of venture capital funds in Europe, uh, really a cornerstone investor in many, many funds through the EIF, but also through national, regional programs. Um, well, I think one of the pictures, uh, one of the things this picture shows is that France has been really upping their uh, inf investments in venture capital in the last few years also echoes uh, many statements by Macron from the last few years that we should have uh, technological autonomy I, th I think that is a, a consequence uh, well we can see this in the graph uh, that they have really uh, upped their game in that as for the Netherlands I think uh, well European uh, Dutch, fans, uh, Dutch VC managers have been really able to tap into the, the EIF quite successfully also national programs and what happens uh, also sometimes is that Dutch fund managers get a uh, mandate from a non-Dutch government to start investing in, in a certain region um, so this, this could mean uh, multiple things but uh, um, uh, what is important I think to, to say is that the share of government uh, uh, allocations in the total funds hasn't really increased over time and it has even decreased uh, in the last year 2021 because uh, fund managers have D Dutch VC managers have been able to tap into a lot of other uh, LPs um, last picture of, of this uh, for fundraising in VC fund of funds is a more of an erratic picture uh, steady increase in, in certain, certain countries and also on European average but in many countries is well room to uh, room to maneuver I, I would say um having a look at growth capital we see uh also that pension funds have slowly started to get interested in this asset class uh, from european uh, gps but again this is very much driven by uh, uk uh, growth capital uh, gps uh, for the rest of the continent, uh, it's very difficult to tap into this uh, investor base. Uh, high net worth individuals also slowly getting more interest into uh, growth capital, but very much driven in by uh, UK and France uh, markets. Slight increase though uh, for uh, the Netherlands uh, in the last year, together with uh, Sweden. Insurers, again, this is more of a French uh, French party, uh, I would say. Okay. And the government, again, this is uh, the French uh, really, I think, showing their commitment in this asset class. Um, so I'd be very interested to see how this develops over time, if they also manage to uh, attract more uh, other capital uh, in this asset class through the French programs. That would be really great. Um, and we do also see a, a slight effect here, uh, I think, of uh, some various government programs in the Netherlands. There's an uptick uh, last year, so uh, it would be very good if uh, VC growth, growth capital managers uh, get to uh, enhance that uh, over the few the next coming years. Um, all right, yeah, that's uh, that's the main. Uh, Things I would like to, to show you uh, the, the 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 recap about what we saw is well uh, we saw a sharp increase in the amounts invested in venture capital uh, over the last uh, few years 
and the last year have been especially uh, spectacular, also in growth capital. Um, but uh, although we've seen an increase in the activity of Dutch VC also, they do not seem to uh, be able to tap into this enormous uh, LP base that we have right in our own country. Now, why is that uh, a pity? Uh, you would think, well, for those companies, it wouldn't matter. Capital is capital. But it's not, of course. Um, if you have a local investor that helps you improve the local ecosystem, uh, improve also your local standing, and for us as a society, it is also better to keep technology, uh, people, um, innovations here to have more technological autonomy. This is also what our publication is about. Um, and uh, what we argue is that uh, with venture capital, growth capital, you have both return, uh, good return, that is uh, really uh, not uh, any worse than uh, many other alternative uh, categories, even better in some uh, respects, but you also have impact uh, on technological innovation and uh, the societal well-being. And we have some uh, uh, testimonials in our uh, publication uh, to, to, to affirm that. Um, I think I'm uh, on time now, sort of, Berg. So, uh, <laughs> Thank you very that. much. Well done. Thanks. Yeah, thank so, you. Thank you, Felix, uh, for these insights. Uh, you have really set the scene now for our discussion with our other guests. And for you, our audience, don't hesitate with any questions. Um, do put them in the chat. Uh, so next, I want to introduce you to Mr. Hans de Ruiter. Hans is CIC Chief Investment Officer at Pension Fund TNO, and he also acts as a board member of Pension Fund Achmea and PMT. And he's a lecturer at Neerode. Hans, thank you for joining us today. Um, TNO stands for Innovation for Life. I happen to know that TNO acts as a corporate investor in some Dutch technology-focused VCs. Uh, Pension Fund PMT, uh, Pension Fund for Metal and Technical Sectors, is also an active in, uh, investor with VC funds and probably one of the, of, of the few. Um, but could you introduce TNO Pension Fund and perhaps also PMT and what their involvement is in the Dutch VC space and how this came about? Yeah, sure. Thank you very much, uh, Berg. Uh, yeah, maybe starting with uh, TNO, since uh, I spent most of my time there. Um, well, you know, the pension plan for uh, uh, TNO Corporation, uh, which is actually an uh, applied science research organization, which works with the government, a lot of companies and organizations. Um, we have about 15,000 participants in the plan, uh, and this is on the management of around 4 billion. Uh, with regard to private equity, um, I think we are one of the few pension plans that have an, uh, a large weight uh, to private equity. Currently, we are at, uh, I think, 12.5%, which is relatively high. Um, it's more than, uh, I, uh, I have to admit that, it's more than our strategic uh, allocation, which is between 5 and 10%. So we are over allocated a bit, but that's simply because the portfolio is doing uh, quite well. Uh, so it's not my fault. Um, we have an uh, allocation between, let's say, venture and growth uh, and buyouts 50-50. Uh, so 50% buyouts, 50% venture and growth. Uh, over time, we have actually increased the allocation to uh, venture and growth simply uh, well because of the very good performance of those categories relative to buyouts. But the other thing that also played a role here is that we feel that venture and growth uh, that adds something to the portfolio that it's hard to find in the listed market. That might be different for buyouts, but especially when you want to focus on new innovations, deep tech, and these kind of things, you really have to go to the venture and growth space. Uh, it's not there in the listed market yet. Uh, and finally, obviously, uh, venture and growth fits quite well with uh, all the activities that we do uh, at our sponsor. So that's also a reason why we have a relatively large allocation to uh, venture and growth. At the moment, we do not have a very specific target allocation to Dutch uh, private equity or Dutch VC. However, uh, 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 when we can find good Dutch private equity managers, uh, we do tend to have a certain preference for that because we also understand and are aware of the fact that uh, investing in Dutch uh, innovations, Dutch companies, 
is good for, uh, for the Dutch economy, the Dutch society at large, uh, and therefore also good for our participants. Uh, and that's uh, why we are having the plan in the end. Uh, so we definitely have a certain preference. Uh, so we also do have a couple of uh, Dutch uh, players in the, the VC and, uh, and growth market. Maybe very briefly on, the, on PMT. Uh, PMT obviously is a very different player in the market, one of the, the big five. Um, with 1.3 million participants and around 100 billion in assets under management. Uh, so it's a, a very different uh, pension plan. Uh, at PMT, we have around 7.5% allocated to uh, private equity, and most of it is in buyouts. But if we do invest, like Berg said, also in, uh, in uh, the Dutch VC space, uh, for example, through innovation industries and uh, Geel the healthcare. Uh, so we do things, uh, but only because uh, it uh, it is linked to a certain, let's say, ESG team theme that's quite important for uh, PMT. So at this point, when we make private equity investments, uh, it needs to be linked to one of the four ESG themes. It needs to have a certain impact, and those themes are innovation, uh, healthcare, uh, energy transition, and the circular economy. Uh, well, but the examples I mentioned, uh, they are, can be easily linked to those four uh, themes. So uh, when we can find that, and uh, we can find it in, in the Netherlands, um, and we feel that there's also a link naturally with uh, our participants, uh, we, we tend to have a uh, preference for those uh, investments. So that's what we do uh, at uh, PMG as an introduction. Well, thank you very much, Hans, uh, for this contribution. Um, maybe. Do you have any advice to give to your Dutch peers, so chief investment officers of other Dutch pension funds or large asset managers in general, when it comes to Dutch VC and maybe private equity investing? And uh, another question is, maybe do you have any questions for our other panelists who are VC fund managers in the technology and the healthcare space? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, maybe you're starting with the advice. Uh, maybe it's good that we separate uh, the big uh, pension plans from the smaller pension plans, uh, and I happen to be uh, at the big one and at the smaller one. Um, I think the, 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 the problem sometimes with um, uh, investing in Dutch VC and growth um, by pension plans in the Netherlands is that when you look at the pension plans in the Netherlands that are active in the private equity space, it's most of the time it's the bigger ones. Uh, and of course, the bigger ones uh, also uh, tend to have a preference for uh, writing bigger tickets. Uh, that's not always possible when you look at uh, the Dutch uh, VC landscape. Um, so therefore, they end up in VC uh, investments uh, abroad, maybe in the US, where you have some of the bigger names, or they simply shy away from that market and focus much more on, uh, on buyouts. Um, and that's uh, that's a pity. So I also uh, would advise also the bigger uh, pension plans also to focus more on the on the Dutch market, simply because we have good managers over there, um, and it's also at the benefit of the participants in the end. I mean, it it helps foster innovation in the Netherlands, it helps foster the economy, uh, and therefore society at large. And that's also one of the objectives they should uh, focus on. Um, then the other one, that's let's say the smaller Dutch pension plans. Um, I think that a lot of smaller Dutch pension plans are not invested in private equity uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, it can be cost uh, because it's seen as an expensive asset category. Um, I come back on that in a minute, but that's more a message for the GPs. Um, so it, it's expensive, that's one. Uh, the other one, it's also labor intensive. And that's also a problem that we struggled with when I came aboard at TNO uh, about 10 years ago. Um, but I also, th also think there's a solution to that, and that might be helpful for the smaller ones. So what we have done, um, we have done two things. First of all, we have uh, hired a consultant who helps us in finding the right managers, who helping us in the whole due diligence process and the monitoring because we are also aware that we cannot do all the work ourselves. I mean, at TNO, we are with, with uh, three people. Um, so we hired uh, Wilshire to do that for us. So we work really uh, as a team. It works quite well. But you also have set up a private equity committee. 
Uh, and what is a private equity committee? It's basically similar to an investment committee, but what you typically find at pension funds, at least in the Netherlands, that then you have external uh, advisors in the investment committee, but they are typically not uh, specialized in private equity. And private equity is a very, uh, let's say, an, it's a different animal that requ requires certain knowledge of the market. And we felt that uh, maybe the investment committee was not the best place to discuss those subjects. So we have set up a private equity committee where we have an, uh, a GP from the Netherlands uh, and a big LP, in this case, uh, Erik Jan Finger from uh, PEGM, who is heading up the, the private equity operation at PEGM. Um, that means that we have the GP perspective, we have the LP perspective of a bigger LP. Um, and they also help us in not only finding the right managers, but also making the, the, the right decisions, having the right discussions. And by having that governance structure in place, it was our feeling at least that uh, although we are small in relative sense, we can still do all the things that we want to do, that we feel we need to do uh, at a good quality level. So I think there are good opportunities also for the smaller pension plans to be active in this market. Um, and it would be a pity if they don't do it because uh, I think uh, private equity offers a lot of opportunities, uh, not only from a pure investment perspective, but also from an ESG perspective, from an impact perspective. If you want to have impact, there are only a few categories where you can be uh, active, uh, typically in the private market, and private equity is one of them. Um, so if you want to, re want to be active there, and I think most of the pension plans do want to, want to do that, and private equity is a good solution. But again, also from a an, uh, from an, uh, pure investment perspective, uh, if you take, for example, 2021, at TNO, we had an, a total return in portfolio of 8.6%. 5%, uh, almost 5% was coming purely from our private equity investments. So 5% from 8%, 8.6%. So it's, it's quite significant. But in PMT, it's, it's the same. Total return, 3.9%. 3% almost is coming from private equity. So if you take it out, we are close to zero. So, and I'm also aware that not every year is 2021. I wish it was, but that's not uh, reason, reasonable. But even if you take a longer time perspective, uh, you can simply calculate uh, the, the added value of private equity. So you, you miss out on that if you don't do it. So also from a pure investment perspective, uh, it's a very interesting, interesting category. So both, both for the bigger ones and the smaller ones. Well, thank you very much, Hans, for this wise word. It's, it's, it's obviously the voice from experience speaking. So thank you very much for that. Um, it's time to move on to our next guest, um, a captain of industry when it comes to early stage investing in life sciences or healthcare. It's Mr. Edward van Wezel. He, um, Edward is a scientist and a VC expert, and he is a founder and managing director, managing partner of Biogeneration Ventures, which is a, a highly successful venture capital firm in that space. Edward, thanks also to you for being with us today. Um, first question, um, life sciences or uh, the healthcare sector is a relatively developed venture capital sector uh, that fares well, also in the Netherlands. And the sector owes a lot to parties such as Hilde Healthcare and Forbion, which have put the Netherlands firmly on the, uh, firmly on the worldwide map uh, of parties to watch when it comes to the future of medicine. Um, your firm, Biogeneration Ventures, has a different positioning than the two firms just mentioned. Um, but could you, could you describe this positioning and also uh, your relation with Forbin? Because I know you, you collaborate a lot and, and why this model also works for you. Thank you, Berg. Uh, thank you for the uh, <coughs> opportunity to be here in, the, in this uh, panel. Um, yeah, let me maybe quickly introduce Biogeneration Ventures uh, for those of the, the audience that haven't heard of us before. So we are an early stage focused life sciences fund with about 250 million assets under management. The latest fund was 140 million fund. Um, um, we focus on um, solely therapeutic applications. Um, so we do not invest in uh, medical devices or diagnostics. Um, and do tickets of about uh, we start very early we with a couple of hundred thousand if necessary up to 15 million uh the fund was established in 2006 um when we started 
uh, uh, as you referenced to Berg, uh, together with was at that time ABN Emro Capital uh, and, and then became Forbian when they, um, uh, that team, uh, the life sciences team of the ABN Emro private equity organization was externalized. Um, and the way we started is the way we still operate uh, with Forbian uh, that is in the form of a, a joint venture where our team, uh, which is a team currently of seven people, focuses on uh, solely on early stage opportunities. We do this across Europe, uh, mainly uh, uh, Benelux, Germany, UK, and the Nordics. Um, and we not only invest in early stage companies, we sometimes also build these companies ourselves. So we, we take new innovations out of the uh, uh, research institutes or, or other organizations, uh, sometimes even pharmaceutical um, companies, and build companies around certain assets that we then develop and, and uh, obviously, hopefully, um, uh, develop into into um, successful exit. The model that we have with Forbian works very well with for us uh, because there is, of course, a bit of a, a conflict if you look at the total assets on the management and the amount of work that goes into building companies from scratch. In particular, it's a lot of time and energy that that goes into that, um, and with a relatively limited. Uh, amount of assets on the management, you have to balance that. And one way to do that is to work with a larger group that has the opportunity to support us, not only um, by uh, providing us infrastructure, et cetera, but also uh, a network and contacts across the world in order to make the right investment decisions and help these companies grow. Top of that, Forbian now has an overlap of about 30% in our portfolio, so they also co-invest in our in our in our companies. Uh, so this model has evolved over time a bit. Um, when we started out, it was really uh, one of the first early stage funds in the Netherlands that that in, in our sector. Um, and we weren't really sure whether the model would work. Uh, over time, I think we have shown uh, that we could be can be quite successful with this model and have um, shown that investing in um, uh, European and certainly also Dutch life sciences companies can be um, uh, very attractive for investors and uh, and uh, LPs uh, in our funds uh, have had the uh, the fruits of that. So obviously, what we like to do is really work with highly innovative technologies, new new products, and build companies around that. Uh, nurture entrepreneurship. Work with founders, scientific founders, but also um, um, people that have uh, experience in building these biotech companies and, and therefore create new drugs and, and provide, um, uh, which is, I think, also a clear characteristic of the healthcare life sciences um, uh, sector, uh, 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 clear impact um, uh, for um, with, with the results that we uh, that we generate. Uh, in terms of uh, providing better medicine to uh, to the to the uh, uh, to the world, so what we try to do um, uh, is to uh, um, build that co those companies. And um, uh, in the in the past uh, fifteen years, we have invested in about uh, thirty companies. Um, and I think what um, the model has shown is that building. Uh, early stage companies that in the last few years has become um, uh, also very attractive for larger funds, particularly in the US, is still an, a very attractive um, opportunity in Europe. In Europe, there is still a lag in terms of you know the the, the total uh, amount of companies that are established. If you look at the um, uh, the output that the universities and the scientific community has in Europe that's almost equal to the United States, for example, but the translation in, in companies and in, in, in products ultimately is still lagging. And that is the opportunity that we want to tap into with, um, with our fund. And therefore, it is very important to, to start these companies uh, in, a, in a proper way. And we, we try to help founders in doing that. So that's what we do, uh, the model has worked quite well, the collaboration with Forbian, but also with other VCs, of course, this, this industry uh, is characterized by a lot of syndication in, in investments. Um, uh, we work with a lot of other, uh, almost all other, I would say, um, active life sciences funds in Europe. 
um, in our in our portfolio. Um, so it's not something you do alone, but we have the opp opportunity to really focus on early stage, which makes us uh, a bit of a special player in the field. Um, maybe to to link into the subject of the discussion today. So um, in particular, uh, looking at uh, our LP base and and and, and invest and investment, we have not had any. Dutch pension funds invest in our fund. I know Forbian has. Uh, uh, we do have, however, European pension funds, uh, other European pension funds invested in our in our fund. So it's not that there is no interest at all in the asset class in Europe, um, but in the Netherlands it has been problematic. We've had various conversations with a, num a, a number of pension funds in the past. I think the asset class has matured, of course, over the last 15 years. Um, we have matured as a fund manager. Of, I think that's also something we need to take into account. When we started in 2006, it was still um, very much early stage in development. But I think if you look at the total assets under management by the by funds like Forbion Gilde, LSP, which is now called EQT, um, uh, that's quite substantial. And they, we are we're relatively large players in the European scene. So I think there is a lot of... Uh, um, uh, growth there, a lot of evolution, and uh, the successes of these funds, our fund, and, and the, the other funds that I just mentioned, um, uh, show that the opportunity is really there, and that you can create really nice returns uh, from uh, investments in in this particular asset class. I'll stop here, Berg. Thank you very much, Edward. And do you think that could be kind of fly? Because I hear you say that there's less, there seems to be less deal flow in Europe than in the US, while the science is here. Do you think that could be a flywheel effect if there would if if more money would go to funding uh, uh, healthcare focused VCs that there could be some kind of flywheel effect also to kind of stimulate that you know entrepreneurship among science. Yeah, and I, I think one of the things that we have seen, of course, also is that that um, uh, uh, European European Investment Fund has tried to to be basically a starter of that, so they have invested quite a bit in our sector over the last uh, decade in order to get such a um, get that flywheel in motion i think they have succeeded to a large extent so uh, when i look at forbian and the forbian growth activities for example that were started most recently they've been very successful in raising funds uh, for uh, for that model uh, and we see this as part of a bigger platform now so what we can offer lps is a very broad reach over different strategies of, for investment uh, um, but it's um, Certainly something that needs further growth. If you compare this to what happens in the United States, what we still lack in Europe is a public market of any importance. There is very limited um, biotech um, um, uh, as a as a um, as a class on the in, in the public markets, and most of the European companies actually go to Nasdaq for their uh, when they go public. So that's still. Um, uh, Missing, I think, is that a big problem? I don't think so. That's that's uh, that that um, is um, uh, something that has worked quite well for a lot of European companies. Um, however, uh, it would be great if we can build further strength in the in the European market to support these companies um, uh, um, uh, in the early stages, but also in the in the later stages of development. Um, and uh, that's something that is is still to happen, I would say. Thank you very much, Edward. Um, it's uh, it's time to move on to our um, to our next guest. Um, um, so next to the life sciences or healthcare sector, technology is another sector that's quite important in the global and European and also Dutch VC space. So we are very happy to also have the tech space represented today. Uh, as we have with us Mr. Jan Willem Bakker. Jan Willem has a rich background in the asset management industry and recently joined as partner responsible for investor relations at Prime Ventures, which is a leading VC firm which backs Europe's future technology leaders. Jan Willem, also thanks to you, thank you for joining us today. Um, you know, uh, the tech VC space is very varied, and according to my research, fintech was a term coined already in 1993, uh, SaaS in 2005, and now we have deep tech, a term coined in 2014, uh, which seems to be an area with, which is still understood by little. Could you give us a quick definition, explanation of all these segments, and maybe we're missing some, and also describe prime venture strategy within that varied tech space? Yeah, sure. So. 
like you said, venture has developed uh, massively over the years. Uh, when our founder Saka Boss started in 99, there were 500 VC firms at the time. Uh, obviously, we had something called the dot-com bubble at the time. So afterwards, there were only five left in Europe. We were one of them. And since then, it has built up to uh, many hundreds again. Uh, obviously, you've also seen the market develop over time. Uh, as mentioned, uh, yeah, there's various different segments within tech that you can invest in. Uh, deep tech, obviously, one of them. Uh, and that's based on substantial scientific or engineering um, developments that need to be done. Uh, software as a service, so SaaS models, where you have web-based software that you sell. Uh, one of those other models that has uh, certainly come up in the last uh, decade, decade and a half. Uh, fintech and related to that insurtech as well, something that we have invested in quite a lot as well, that uh, has a uh, very, especially in Europe, uh, important model to invest in. Then marketplaces, I think, are most uh, prominent investment, at least for what people know is from in the Netherlands, like takeaway, uh, is still one of those uh, segments that uh, both in Europe and the US is quite big. We've shied away from it a bit in the last uh, five to 10 years, but uh, it was big for a long time. And then there's obviously also consumer uh, models, whether that is B2B or B2C, um, that uh, and those are both uh, prevalent there, but lots of opportunities there to invest as well in uh, Europe and indeed the Netherlands. Um, that's also uh, relating to our strategy. So we uh, focus uh, mostly on Northwestern Europe uh, with our investments. Uh, our AUM is about 750 million, currently raising a next fund. So hopefully we go over a billion uh, this year. Um, our investments uh, are late A, early B generally. Uh, so we write relatively big tickets of about 10 to 35. So our portfolio construction is more like a buyout fund rather than a venture fund. Um, that gives us quite large ownership stakes, but uh, the companies we invest in already are revenue positive and uh, we're looking for a profit in the years uh, we invest in, dependent on how much they grow, obviously. Um, we do that with a team of about 15 people with different backgrounds from different European countries as well. Um, LP base, uh, also like Edward mentioned, we do have some of the, some Dutch LPs. Uh, mostly legacy clients uh, from when we started out. I think uh, people were a bit more experimental uh, in investing uh, at that time probably than now. Um, what we do have uh, in Europe is uh, some of the uh, fund of funds indeed, as well as uh, some other European pension funds. I think, uh, like Hans mentioned, he uses a service provider as well. I think that's uh, and where you also see a lot of, and it would be interesting to learn from Felix as well, maybe in the future, how much Dutch capital goes through service providers to uh, in a, a Dutch VCs or indeed um, biosciences funds. Um, then another thing I think that's quite interesting to also uh, as the LP base in the future, uh, if you look at the returns in VC, um, it, especially in the last decade, I think Europe has really caught up and overtaken the US. A lot of LPs obviously still invest uh, in US VC because they want to keep their allocations, but uh, returns have certainly not proven to be uh, necessarily better than in Europe. So that's, I think, an, also an interesting development and something for uh, us as a European community to emphasize more and more. Yeah. You're on mute, uh, Beth. Okay, sorry for that. Um, so Prime Venture, so thank you for that contribution. Uh, Prime Venture is, is a well-established Dutch firm and it has been around for decades, but you also have uh, offices in London and Zurich. Could you explain the choice for these locations and, and what are the, why is it beneficial to you? Yeah, sure. So I think uh, hey, when you're competing for deals, you need to be in the places where you can, uh, can find them uh, in the best possible way. Uh, I think yeah, London is still the European capital of private equity and venture, so it makes sense to be there. It's not only that you can find deals there, but also at the, the law firms, uh, other consultants, uh, a lot of the uh, fund of funds as well. So it's, it's more the ecosystem than anything else. And I think that goes for Zurich as well. Uh, after London, still the biggest hub for private equity and venture in Europe as well. So for us, it makes sense uh, with a northern North <coughs> European coverage to to be in those places where we can best uh, serve both uh, our LPs as well as um, have a good network for investments. And that means that uh, with 
uh, London, Amsterdam, and Zurich, we are well um, covered to uh, be active in those markets where we want to be. Thank you, uh, Jan Willem. Um, it has been quite silent in the chat, um, but maybe somebody wants to raise their hand and ask a question. We have still a few minutes left. Well, no, then that's also fine. Uh, I think it'll, it's also good to be respectful of each other's time. But I think that, you know, if you if you would have any questions to any of the committee members or even to the speakers, I'm sure we can all find each other maybe through LinkedIn or there's other ways. So don't hesitate. Bert, I see, I see a question. Um, yeah, okay. It's, Go it's ahead. around. Uh, around I think yeah, thanks for the question. It's around uh, do we need to discuss cost? I think it's uh, that's a relevant topic, obviously. Uh, maybe I we give give the question to Hans as he is also uh, aware of of the cost from the different asset types and also in his position uh, as a CIO of uh, of uh, TNO but also uh, of the uh, other as a board member of the other pension fund. So Hans, please please go ahead. How uh, what is your view on cost? And you already mentioned that you have a message for your GP. So maybe that's yeah, I forgot to, uh, to to tell that, um, but. I think definitely it's it, it's a subject that we need to discuss uh, because it's it's a subject that comes back every year, um, and I don't believe that we can not discuss it uh, for the next ten years and do nothing. So at some point it will uh, will impact us all. So I think it's in the interest of the LPs, but also in the interest of the GPs uh, to cons reconsider maybe the cost structure. Uh, at, uh, I think most of the people in the pension fund industry feel, uh, also the CIOs, feel that the cost structures are simply too high. Uh, but the reason why we pay it is simply because the, well, it's uh, the balance of power is at the moment uh, with the GPs and not that with the LPs. Uh, so I hope at some point in time that will change, but that's, uh, that's a fact. Um, but I really feel that the cost structures are simply too high uh relative to what we pay to other asset classes uh and it's not that uh, that private equity managers do things that are so exceptional relative to all the other asset classes that the that it's uh well uh, reasonable so um if i, I may think I, go ahead go ahead Hans. yeah so i think it's in the interest uh of both uh the lps and, and the gps to think about it also for the gps but also to make our life easier. I mean, we have to defend, the, the, uh, we have to discuss this subject every year with the board, with the participants. Well, you, you have also read the newspapers. So uh, we had some uh, interesting uh, press on the PSP and the APP. Um, and, and, and at some point, we also need to, to deal with that. I mean, uh, it, it's not uh, very helpful if you have to go to the boards and to your participants and every year you need to defend uh, that you uh, can pay so much money to private equity, although it's a small part of your portfolio, et cetera, et cetera. But um, I, think, I, I think a difference must there be made between kind of very established, very large, you have the very large private equity players and you have the, the, the venture capital part. And, you know, um, I, in my day job, I happen to know that most managers, they're not even profitable until their third fund, and maybe I don't have all the data. Um, but I think we really need to make a difference between uh, venture capital and also fund sizes, I think, and larger managers. And again, there you have, again, the question, okay, do you want to invest then in, in, in smaller tickets and what looks more expensive at first sight, but I, I do know, I do know that that's a big hurdle. I do know there's pricing committees even that do not even allow, you know, uh, management fees above a certain hurdle. So yeah, I, I, I we do understand that it's, it's, it's a topic. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a topic. I think uh, in both our interests, uh, it's helpful if we deal with that. And uh, yeah. well, maybe uh, the Dutch VC uh, ecosystem can make a difference there. Uh, you never know. To lower the bar and to make it easier, um, but at least it's a subject. And, but um, it's good to have the discussion. I think it's good to have the discussion. Uh, absolutely. I think we might have a question. Uh, uh, time for one other question. If and, and feel free to 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 drop off if you need to go to your next call or your next meeting. But for those who want to stay, I think uh, Dirkjan, do you want to choose yeah. another question? 
Yeah, I think let's talk a bit about ESG and impact. It was mentioned also before, but I think it's very relevant as it uh, as it clearly is an additional benefit of investing in VC. But of course, it's it's uh, yeah. The question is, how do you measure it with your fund, and and do you make use of specific standards? Maybe Edward, can I give the word to you on this uh, specific question? How will you take this sure. into consideration? Yes, we have. Uh, um, uh, of course, this is also uh, something that we. Um, I think is uh, quite important. What we have, have actually developed is a system by which we rate the, the various investments that we do um, um, from a perspective of impact. Um, so we try to um, um, have or in a way standardize this. Uh, there is there is little, at least in the life science industry, um, that that is generally used over the over different uh, uh, funds. So we, we started with this a couple of years ago um, and, and monitor, monitor this over time. Um, so um, and with this system, uh, we simply rate the companies in, in, in on, on various um, specific items re related to e ESG. Uh, so that is, I think, very helpful and certainly also very important for our, our LPs. Um, so that's something that uh, that is um, clearly on top of mind. And do you also see, for example, now the regulatory field is moving and we have now SFDR upcoming, Article 8, Article 9. Is that something you also take into consideration? Uh, um, I, I think we have to, Livian. So that, that's those are things that we also uh, also uh, uh, monitor and, and and of course adjust to uh, when that is uh, when required. Thanks. Okay. Well, um, thank you very much also for your questions. Um, it's it's a pity that we do not have more time for our discussion today, but there will be other opportunities. Uh, the, the, C, the 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 private equity and venture capital committee of the CFA ZBA Society is already preparing its next event. It's probably going to take place in September October, and it's most likely going to be an in person event. Um, uh, I'm. For now, I would like to end with maybe one key takeaway of today's session, or maybe better, a key takeaway from the NVP publication, the untapped potential of Dutch venture capital that inspired today's webinar. Uh, Dutch VC represents a very attractive investment opportunity from an impact perspective, from a much needed innovation perspective, but also from a financial perspective. And I think that's a strong kind of conclusion of that uh, publication. And then I would like to thank once again all of our speakers, Edward van Wezel from Biogeneration Venture, Jan Willem Bakker from Prime Ventures, Hans de Ruiter from TNO Pension Fund, and Felix Zwarts from NVP. And I, also, I would also like to thank you, our audience, for listening in today, for making time in your schedules, and I do hope to see you at one of our future events. Have a really good day. Thank you.